So good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Dennis Hancock. I get to be the center director at the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center. We are part of the USDA ARS, the Ag Research Service. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, two of our research units are located here in Madison on, on campus, and then we have another research unit located in Marshfield in central Wisconsin. Um, we have a little bit of an unusual situation. Uh, Post-COVID, we're still having some challenges from COVID with uh, air travel. And our speaker today, Rick Grant, was very much intending on being here in person, but uh, it seems that United had other plans. So uh, he's going to uh, be joining us via Zoom. He did go ahead and send a video just so that we don't have any Zoom interruptions or any challenges there. So he shared his presentation by Zoom, but he'll also be here at the end for Q&A. We all apologize for this. This was obviously totally unforeseen, but uh, you know, when, when the airlines cancels the, uh, the flight, we have no, no other choice. So with no further ado, I'm going to uh, share his presentation uh, via video, um, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. If you did not get a copy of the handout, uh, please see us at the back. We've got some extra copies there for you. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Rick Grant from Minor Institute in Northern New York. Um, my topic today, as you can see, is um, looking at how we might optimize alfalfa and corn silage proportions or ratios in diets for dairy cattle. I certainly hope to be there in person this morning, and I apologize for this uh, probably pretty weak substitute, but United Airlines had uh, different plans for me yesterday and I couldn't get out of Burlington in time to get here today anyway. So um, hopefully we can we can get through this. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opp opportunity to record this and uh, get the information out to you anyway. Before I get started though, if I were there in person, I always like to ask for a show of hands, how many folks have actually been to Minor Institute? And it may not be as much fun to do that with, with me just being a talking head in the corner of the slide here. But uh, if you haven't been to Minor Institute, we are in a little town called Shazy in the far rural north uh, east corner of, of New York State, just about five miles south of the Canadian border, as a matter of fact. Um, but it is a beautiful place. And the reason why I show these first two slides is to tell you that if you haven't been there before, or if you, even if you have, we'd love to have you come visit for the first time or come back again. We love visitors up here. It's a beautiful place. We have about a 500 head Holstein herd where we do our research, which I'll be sharing with you in just a minute today, as a matter of fact. But anyway, come come visit. I have to say, honestly, come visit. Come visit in the summer, come visit in the fall, because in a couple of weeks up here, it probably won't be as much fun. <laughs> anyway, but that is a preamble and it kind of be efficient today since you're looking at me and not in person, so we don't make this too long and drawn out. Um, my topic, alfalfa and corn silage. Well, um, certainly we know that those two forages are predominant. They are the two big forages in the U.S. Uh, in terms of feeding dairy cattle. Um, but boy, talk about two different trend lines, huh? If you look at this between 1982 and 2012, where there's uh, data available that I could find, corn silage production increased markedly. At the same time, production of alfalfa hay declined by three quarters. Now, holy cow, what a difference. Um, and yet, and Part of the reason for doing this research, I should say it was funded by ARS, by the Ag Research Service and NAFA, right, to the Alfalfa and Forage Alliance. Um, you know, the, the, one of the underlying questions was, you know, why is that? Why is, why, is, why is the trend line so down, going down so rapidly or to such an extent with alfalfa? And so, what, but you know, it's not necessarily a simple answer. It's gonna vary by farm, from farm to farm in terms of why you would raise alfalfa or corn silage, right? And certainly we think about relative difficulty to grow each crop and the yield potential. Certainly it's no, there's no doubt that intensification, the term that's used commonly of the dairy industry, you know, larger farms, larger production units, certainly is driven a greater reliance on corn silage as a primary forage. Although there's current research, which would say that it's at the expense of soil carbon. So there can be some agronomic trade-offs there for sure, uh, environmental trade-offs. And, you know, alfalfa certainly does have proven benefits for soil health, as you can see, nitrogen fixation, and, and perhaps overall sustainability of the dairy forage system, you know, but we need to think about, you know, what are the pros and cons of each forage, and, and my goal this morning with our research was nutritionally, you know, um, is, is, is there an optimum ratio of the two, 
And so, you know, going into that, then certainly we know that uh, corn silage and alfalfa are complementary forages nutritionally in, in many ways. And just real quickly, you know, certainly the fiber characteristics are, are complementary. If you look at alfalfa, it has higher indigestible fiber or UNDF 240, undigested NDF at 240 hours of in vitro fermentation, which is sort of the, the common terminology that maybe you've all heard by now. But anyway, UNDF 240 or indigestible fiber is much higher with alfalfa, but the fast pool uh, of, of alfalfa, it, it ferments so much more rapidly that in corn silage that really you do have pretty good rumen turnover and good dry matter intake. Uh, the relative intake uh, responses published in the literature between corn silage and alfalfa have been variable. And we'll see in a moment that we didn't see big differences between the two forages actually with high producing cows. But nonetheless, that both forages can have very good fiber digestibility, but typically you think of immature alfalfa that you wanna to feed to a dairy cow as having pretty good rates of fiber digestion and, and, and a much, uh, um, I, I'd say a much faster, <laughs> fast pool, if you will. Sounds a little redundant, but anyway, that's, that's what it is. Now, protein, of course, you always focus on protein. Most people do that first, right? Immature alfalfa harvested at the right stage of maturity is gonna have over 20% crude protein as a percent of the dry matter. And also compared to corn, which is notoriously low in lysine, we'd expect more lysine, uh, for maybe a, a little bit more methionine even too from, from alfalfa. Um, and then the starch content, of course, now the benefit uh, shifts toward corn silage. And of course, it's all high moisture corn, right? High moisture starch. And so it has a very high uh, rumen fermentability. And so you might think that there's good potential for complementarity in the rumen, right? Between the fermentable starch from the corn silage and then this high protein from the alfalfa, which is fairly high in rumen degradable protein, those could complement each other and provide nice uh, synchronized substrates for the rumen microbes to produce microbial protein. All right, I don't have time to get into that today, but the bottom line is if that does happen, if there is a synergy and this complementarity, uh, and if there's a sweet spot, so to speak, in terms of proportions, uh, you might expect to see better performance and certainly better uh, milk components, milk protein in particular, perhaps. All right, so I just said that. Um, so the bottom line in terms of an introduction here today is there is, I think, the potential to optimize the interaction between the RDP, the rumen degradable protein of alfalfa, and the fermentable starch uh, from the high moisture corn and the corn silage to boost or to, to, to enhance this microbial protein production, which we hear so much about all the time, all right? Now, of course, I need to step back and say, okay, this is gonna be one study that I'll share with you today. Um, and, and a ration formulation approach or strategy certainly can affect the right combination of alfalfa and corn silage. And of course, you know, other dietary ingredients that are part of the diet, uh, those can all affect how a cow is going to respond in terms of intake and, and solids corrected milk production to any combination of alfalfa and corn silage, certainly. But I feel that what we did in this, in this trial was that we tried to, to formulate diets which would be pretty typical of what you might feed across pretty broad swaths of the U.S. So I think it's a pretty robust uh, study that we did, and hopefully it's going to be applicable to anybody sitting in the audience today. Um, so... The practical question we are driving at, well, there's no doubt that economic, environmental, even social uh, considerations, factors are really encouraging dairy farmers to feed higher fiber, higher forage diets. And so, as I said a few minutes ago, looking at the trend line down with alfalfa, maybe we ought to reconsider alfalfa and ration formulation and, and certainly our nutrient planning programs. And, and to me, the two big practical questions we are driving at were one, can we successfully feed more alfalfa and dairy rations? All right, and is there a nutritional benefit of feeding more alfalfa? So we did a study last year at Minor Institute. And again, that was our goal. We wanted to see if there's any positive associative effects or interactions between alfalfa, hay, and we used hay. And that's important to keep in mind. I'll come back to that. And corn silage in terms of uh, producing the amount or the efficiency of production of milk protein and milk fat. So energy corrected milk or solids corrected milk overall. Two points I want to make that, that make this study, I think, particularly useful uh, to the dairy industry today is that, uh, as you'll see in a moment, we had very high dry matter intake and energy corrected milk. So milk has been corrected for the components, particularly fat and protein, um, higher than, than I think only one other study in the literature, all right? And as you'll see in just a moment, we had a wide range in alfalfa to corn silage ratios 
that we evaluated, right? All the way from 90, 10 at one extreme. So 90% alfalfa, 10% corn silage in the, in the blend of forage to the other extreme. So only 10% uh, corn silage, 9% alfalfa. And maybe I said that wrong, but you see what I'm saying? So the range, then we had three intermediate diets to go along with that. And so this is not the most important slide for this morning, but I do show it to say we, we used, you know, uh, quite a few cows, both multi and primipara. So first calf heifers as well as older cows. We fed these animals for a total of five weeks, but four weeks on each study, on, on, on each diet, and then measured their responsiveness after that period of time. So pretty long-term adaptation. Um, as you can see, there are the five diets again, all the way from 90-10 alfalfa corn silage through 70-30, 50-50 blend, 30-70, then 10-90 of alfalfa corn silage. And in this picture here, you can see this is just a shot of the inside of our barn, one of our research pens. So in this study, the cows were housed in sand bedded free stalls. It was a two row pen head to head, and they all had their individual feed boxes. So we were able to keep the cows housed as you would on most any modern dairy farm today or commercial farm, but also able to track dry matter intake very accurately. All right. So I mentioned alfalfa hay. Now, many of you in the audience would be looking at this and thinking, well, I'm going to be feeding alfalfa silage probably. Um, we used alfalfa hay because it ensured consistency throughout the whole study. And that was, the, that was the overriding reason why we did that. Now I know on a farm, um, you, you may not be feeding alfalfa hay, especially as 90% of the forage because of all that dry forage, it might be challenging. But I will say, if you go back to some of the USDA research done here in Madison, uh, a number of years ago, years ago by Glenn Broderick, at least with similar quality forages, hay and, and silage don't have big differences in terms of intake and, and energy corrected milk production. So that, that's good. So I think as you look at this, you can kind of think, well, this is done with hay and ensured a consistent nutrient profile of that hay throughout the entire study. Um, I'm going to be feeding silage, but I would expect similar responses, just maybe some different practical challenges on the farm in terms of how you chop, how you avoid shrink with, with, with you know, some of the fines blowing away, do you add water, things of that nature, okay? But anyway, you can see we purchased all of the hay from an Ohio producer, a very high quality, as you'll see in a few slides. And we chopped it with a hay buster, if you're familiar with that. It does a pretty good job of consistently chopping the forage, like a, like a hammer mill sort of approach. A three and a two inch screen is what we used. All right. So here's a composition, just an abbreviated composition for today's purposes. Uh, you can see crude protein, of course, was much higher with the alfalfa hay, uh, NDF, uh, ash, ash corrected, amylase modified, which is how we should be measuring NDF, by the way, in this day and age quite low, so very high quality alfalfa hay. Right? And you can see the ADL, the lignin content, again, was, was quite low. And as you'll see in a few minutes, the cows really responded in a way that would, would tell you that this was high quality alfalfa hay. And that's what we we're shooting for. We want high quality alfalfa. And on the, on the corn silage side, you can look at those specs, you know, about 37% NDF, uh, you know, about 36% starch. Uh, you can see the starch fermentability there, seven hour measured. Um, you know, it wasn't BMR for sure, it's conventional. And I, I would say we tried to choose this silage for comparative purposes because at least in our world, it's pretty common, pretty typical. So it's not the best, but it's certainly not the worst. It's right in there in terms of a typical corn silage that we would feed, all right? So if you look at the dietary ingredients then, and, and several of the slides we set up this way, so I'll take a moment to orient you. So across the top, we have alfalfa, hay to corn silage ratio on a dry matter basis all the way from 1090, so only 10% of the forage is alfalfa, 90% corn silage all the way up to the other extreme, 90-10. So you can see the three intermediates right here in the middle is 50-50, alfalfa corn silage on a dry basis. All of those dyes, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, were 62% forage, so pretty high forage diets, right? And we did add water to the 50-50, 70-30, and 90-10, so the highest alfalfa diets, we added water to keep them all at least within a reasonable range of moisture content. So that wouldn't be a problem in terms of intake, all right? So you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, how corn silage uh, sort of ramped down, alfalfa hay ramped up, and then we had concentrate blends that uh, complemented each ratio of alfalfa and corn silage. All right, so just a little bit of a closer look, again, abbreviated look for today's purposes in terms of the, the five diets. You can see the dry matter content range some. As I said, we added water to the highest alfalfa diet so that they wouldn't really exceed 60% dry matter. We felt that anywhere between 40 and 
<clears throat> or in this case, 45% dry matter and 60% dry matter in the TMR would be would be pretty reasonable, pretty reflective of what, what we would see out in, in, in the commercial world, right? Now, you can see crude protein increased as we increased alfalfa in the forage. And this was done on purpose when we formulated the diet. <clears throat> excuse me, we were hoping to let protein kind of creep up with more alfalfa, but we were trying to use the model, the formulation model, to have the sim a similar supply of metabolizable protein across all five diets. Now, I don't have that data with me today, but long story short, after the fact, we measured all of the all the dietary ingredients and, and reassess the diets. Actually, metabolizable protein supply did, excuse me, creep up a little bit as we went from the lowest to the highest alfalfa ratio. And also lysine supply did too, just a tad. Um, so that, that definitely did, gives a benefit to the higher alfalfa uh, content, the higher alfalfa proportions. But you know, when you think about it, that, that that's sort of an inherent benefit of the alfalfa, I would say, all right? So anyway, that, that explains that. So MP supply was expected to be the same, but in fact, it went up slightly as you went from low to high. NDF dropped uh, by about a percentage or so with each incremental increase in alfalfa reflecting its high quality and its NDF relative to the corn silage NDF. Uh, starch, you can see, was pretty close, pretty similar across all diets, although, of course, um, the starch from the higher corn silage diets was more from the corn silage, so it would have been more fermentable. I need to keep that in mind. Sugar about the same, uh, total fat, and not much difference there as well. Anyway, so here's, here's a picture of the diets. And hopefully you can see that. I, I wish I could be there with you to kind of see uh, how, how big the screen is and everything. But you can see as we go from left to right, this is the higher corn silage diet, 90% corn silage, 10% alfalfa. Through the intermediates, 50-50 down to 90% alfalfa. And you can see that the long particles hang in there. So the alfalfa has certainly had a pool of longer particles, the stems, which provided physical effectiveness to the, to the fiber in these diets. But try as we would, um, we had too many fines. We really had a hard time uh, keeping a nice distribution of particles, especially if you think about the Penn State particle separator, where it has the top, then that eight millimeter second pan, which is so important to the cow, then the fines. We had a hard time keeping enough particles on that second, that eight millimeter uh, tray or pan in the Penn State particle separator. And, and you can kind of see that if you take a look, there's a lot of fines, even though there's some there, there's, there's a decent amount of stems here. And I this isn't in your slide set if you have the, have the handouts, but I put this in here just to make a point, and maybe this is more for the, for the nutritionists in the audience. But if you look at physical effectiveness factor, PEF, so when you shake out the TMR, that's the percentage of, of, of the diet of the particles which are retained on the eight millimeter, so the second sieve and the top. So the top two added together as a percent of the whole, that's I would say like 62%, 0.62 is the physical effectiveness factor for the higher corn silage diet. And you can see that dropped with each increase in, in percent alfalfa. And that reflects the fineness of the chop that we ended up with with this alfalfa, all right? And just looking at that, you would have expected, man, there's going to be some problems with the higher alfalfa diet in terms of, of milk fat or rumination, things of that nature. And I'll share with you in a minute, we didn't see as much of an effect as we would have thought. All right. Likewise, the UNDF 240, our, our, our lab measurement of indigestible fiber, which has become so common in the industry in the last five, six, seven years, um, as you went from the lowest corn silage to the highest alfalfa, that crept up. And that simply reflects the fact that alfalfa has more indigestible fiber or UNDF 240 than corn silage, all right? And again, a pretty broad range. Uh, but in the next slide, I'm gonna show you intake and ECM really didn't change much across all five diets. Um, I just wanna make one quick point, not my main point today, but worth thinking about, all right? If you multiply the two together, so you're thinking about within each TMR, the particle size and the UNDF 240, if you kind of integrate those two, and we've called it <laughs> physically effective UNDF 240 for lack of a more creative term, you can see there's not as much of a range here, you know, maybe from 4.75 up to about 5.7, all right? Um, boy, there's not much of a range. It's right in the middle of what we've seen with other diets in terms of, of, of high producing typical lactation cow diets. And by golly, the intakes didn't change much, neither did the PEUNDF, even though we had quite a range in particle size 
and you end up to 40. So maybe that's a bit of a tangent for some of you in the audience this morning, but again, I'd like the nutritional community to at least be thinking about that, that there's value in looking at particle size and some measure of indigestibility, UNDF 240 in this case, or perhaps digestibility. So let's jump into what the cows told us real quickly. All right, well, here's a lot of numbers, but you know what they tell us? Across that whole big wide range of alfalfa and corn silage, nada. The cows produced the same in terms of dry matter intake. And look at, they had some high dry matter intakes. They're pushing 60 pounds, but also very efficient, 1.7, 1.8, and very high ECM, around 106, 105 pounds a day. So the cows were cranking. And so the take home number one for me is that, uh, boy, you can feed a wide range of alfalfa to corn silage and a TMR, the way we formulated it for this study, and not change intake, milk production, or efficiency of energy correct milk production at all. So take home number one. But if we drill down just a little bit deeper and look at milk components, which really was our main, one of our main objectives for this study, okay, we look at this, again, we've got the same five diets. So up here at the top, huh, fat percent and production of fats, pounds per day, no difference, but very high level, all over 4% fat. All right, so that would tell me, despite the, the, the trailing off in particle size, things were still going right in the rumen, right, to, to uh, maintain fat percent and fat output, all right? But look at true protein. This is kind of interesting here. Uh, if we look at production, pounds per day of true protein, you can see that, there, that the highest true protein output and also actually the lowest MUNs, which kind of go together, right? If you're capturing more of the dietary nitrogen, putting it into the milk in terms of milk protein, you should have less MUNs, a little more efficiency of nitrogen use. Uh, looks like an optimum spot, at least in our study with our formulation is around 30-70, maybe 50-50. And also if you think about all the published research that's out there, it might say that same ratio up to 50-50, but certainly 30-70 alfalfa to corn silage in our 62% forage diets um, resulted in a significantly greater protein output and significantly less MUNs. <clears throat> I won't make a big deal out of it today, but also if you've been following the de novo fatty acid story, excuse me, um, you can see that the de novo fatty acids, which are a good barometer of fiber fermentation in the rumen, they're just a touch higher with that same 30-70 and certainly 50-50 diet. And I don't have it here, but the, the, the double bonds per fatty acid, sort of the milk fat depression metric was also best in these same diets, the 30-70, maybe the 50-50. So all of this together on this slide tells me that, okay, if you're looking at milk components and optimizing the, the fermentation in the rumen, especially fiber fermentation, um, man, you better be shooting for 30-70, maybe 50-50, all right? So there's second take home. First take home is you can feed a wide range if you're looking at intake and ECM overall. If you're looking to boost milk protein and, and boost nitrogen efficiency, 3070 is not a bad place to be. All right. Um, previous research has been quite a few papers published, but it's been variable in terms of response to the alfalfa and corn silage ratios. Got to say, you know, many, many studies say the majority of the studies published show no effect on intake and milk yield as corn silage to alfalfa ratio change, right? Some have showed a positive effect on intake or milk yield as alfalfa increased. One study showed a positive effect on intake in milk yield as corn silage increased, all right? So it's hard to say, but, but several of the papers make the point, and you could say, well, why did you do your study then, right? Uh, that if you avoid the extremes in terms of alfalfa to corn silage ratio, so try to get in the middle, 50-50, thereabouts, you know, that's probably your best chance for most formulations with most ingredients that we have on the farm to optimize solids or energy corrected milk yield, all right? And certainly our study with these cows nailed that down that, you know, that probably just under 50, 50, maybe 30, 70, right in there. Okay. All right. Now just, we did, we were able to measure rumination response. We had SCR collars on these cows. We were able to measure that. Um, and you can see there's the range uh, from about 500 minutes a day, which is great um, on down to 396, which is a little bit iffy to, to my way of thinking, 440. So 449 up to 499 is, is, is reasonable. Um, the highest amount of chopped alfalfa hay is a pretty fine diet, dropped rumination. But yet recall, that, or I'll, I'll move back there, you know, fat test was numerically the highest there. So it certainly didn't affect fat test. 
Um, the bottom line, though, is that overall, you know, rumination milk fat were in pretty desirable ranges, at least for the 1090 up to the 770-30 alfalfa to corn silage diets. Um, and I think it goes back to that combination of particle size and UNDF 240 in the alfalfa. You get into a sweet spot in terms of where we want our physically effective UNDF 240 to be, right around that five, uh, five and a half percent or so. All right. So some conclusions from our study would be, as I said, high producing cows, high intake cows, um, you feed a wide range. That allows you a wide latitude in terms of your forage blends that you have on the farm, what you purchase, what you grow, all right? Um, I just said this, but you know, changes in the true protein output, MUN, previous published work, there's the optimal ratio and small changes in the fatty acid metrics, which we've grown used to looking at over the last few years uh, as a barometer of, of, of rumen fiber digestion, fermentation, it all suggests the same thing, all right? And then rumination, um, despite the small particle size was pretty good for the majority of the diets. It's just, it was a little bit depressed at the highest alfalfa content. And again, I think that was a function of particle size, not alfalfa per se. All right, but now we need to, I'll just take my last five, 10 minutes to talk about some, you know, some further considerations because you know, as you look at this data, say, okay, you know, nutritionists, dairy farmers probably could gather, you know, yeah, you can optimize alfalfa and corn silage and get a boost in terms of milk components and nitrogen efficiency. But, you know, factors in addition to just the nutritional factors in the response to the diet are probably going to, on any farm, determine what's the optimum corn silage, alfalfa silage or hay ratio in terms of grown forage, purchased forage, and what you actually feed. And I've, I made a laundry list here, you know, cost of production, of course, is a big one. Um, agronomic considerations, I alluded to some of those, and there's no doubt people in the audience who know <clears throat> more about the agronomics than I do for sure I'm a nutritionist. <clears throat> Water usage is a big, big difference, can be a big difference. And a big one for me as a nutritionist is the variability potentially in nutrient profile across cuttings for alfalfa versus just the single cut for corn silage. And again, we took that out of the equation in this study because we had a uniform lot of alfalfa, granted that, right? And then, of course, a big one in terms of economics is the relative cost of protein sources, right? If protein sources, supplements are high, that tends to make alfalfa more competitive, more economical in the diet, doesn't it? All right. So we need to think of all of these. The best answer in terms of the right ratio, the optimal ratio, sustainable ratio of alfalfa to corn silage, that's going to require whole farm modeling. Um, that's under development. That's not available today. And, and that modeling is out of my bailiwick for sure. But after we finish this study, talking to people like uh, Kristen Reed at Cornell, who works with the folks right here in your backyard in Madison at, at the ARS station, the Forge Research Center, um, they're working on that diligently. And hopefully in not too long a time, we'll be able to take data like this and combine it with the agronomic data and be able to model on a given farm basis, what is the true optimum alfalfa to corn silage ratio, All right? So that's ongoing work. Um, to, to optimize that uh, from both the nutritional, agronomic, and economic perspective. I can't share, with, share that with you today, but I hope that somebody will be sharing that with you in the near future. But what I do have for you as I wrap up, we worked with uh, Kristen and Larry Chase at Cornell and just some very simple, simplistic, I'll say modeling in quotation marks with the Cornell model, the Cornell net carbohydrate protein system model, which is I'd say maybe the most common uh, ration formulation model, at least in the US, many millions of cows are, are fed with that, uh, globally at least. Um, we used the AMTS platform. That's one of the uh, of the um, forms of that you can purchase and use. Um, I looked at three things. We looked at three things, cost and returns, okay? And then output of, of manure, and then acreage needed for these different diets. And so very simple, but just, food for thought as we wrap up this morning. So we know the optimum in terms of nutrition. What can we what can we begin to think about relative to economics? Well, this was all done with economics 2021 when we did the study. So you can adjust this, you could adjust this based on any prevailing economic uh, situation. But here are the diets again, just as I've talked about them. Okay, so value of the milk, you can see it's um, highest with the 3070. And that reflects not only the volume, but also the higher protein, right? The, the components. I just explained why that would be. Now, if you look at purchase feed costs, dollars per cow per day, well, if corn silage only 
is grown on the farm and, the, and you're purchasing the alfalfa hay, obviously the diet's gonna get more expensive as you go to higher alfalfa diets, all right? But if corn silage and alfalfa are both grown on the farm, hay or silage, you can see that the opposite occurs, right? You actually get uh, cheaper diets. And that reflects the fact that you're, you're uh, buying less, relatively less expensive, potentially more expensive protein supplements, all right? So it makes a big difference whether corn silage or both corn and alfalfa are grown on the farm. Now, I think that's a pretty solid take home, all right? Then the income over purchase feed cost, dollars per cow per day. Again, you can see that if corn silage is grown on the farm only and you're purchasing the alfalfa hay, uh, that tends to drop. But if you're growing both and you look at the income over purchase feed cost, it certainly makes sense to use the alfalfa. And in fact, you know, you can see that it tends to be a little bit higher for that 30, 70 than the 90, 10. If you look at, and that just reflects changes in components and milk output and so forth, right? So that's that, all right? So we need, to, we need to think about economics. And if you grow both of the forages on the farm, at least using the Cornell model and some of that simpler approach, um, it can, alfalfa can be very, very economical, all right? And just real quick, using the same model, looking at manure output, nitrogen and methane, um, you can see that there's not much going on in terms of manure, pounds per cow per day, or fecal nitrogen, and you would expect that. That doesn't vary too much relative to diet, but we sure to see a change in urine, urinary nitrogen, and ammonia emissions as predicted by the equations in this model. And you can see that actually with the higher alfalfa diet, uh, remember I said we, we ended up overfeeding metabolizable protein or nitrogen a little bit with some of these higher diets, and that, that's reflected in the higher uh, urinary nitrogen and ammonia con, uh, emissions. But highlighted in red here, you'll see that that, that 3070, that optimum diet relative to milk components, also had the lowest urinary nitrogen. So it all ties together in terms of the nitrogen efficiency of these cows. And there's not much going on with methane that I can see here. Again, no statistics. This is just running the data after the study was collect, uh, conducted through the model, all right? Um, and maybe for, for what it's worth, it's a little bit less with the optimum ratio, but I wouldn't hang my hat on that necessarily. All right, so then finally, looking at forage needs, and there could be a lot more work, a lot more sophistication going into this, but I've highlighted the 3070 right here in the middle. All right, and you can see, so if you wanted to, to feed that uh, purchased, or, or excuse me, in this case, homegrown, you can see the, the corn silage tons and the corn silage acres that you would need per cow per year. And likewise, the alfalfa hay tons and, and, and acres per cow per year. But the point I want to leave you with here is that you do need to think, you know, what's optimum for a farm is going to be driven a little bit by, um, by, by, by your acreage, by, by what you have available for growing your crop. Because if you look at the extremes here, you can see that if you're feeding a, a primarily corn silage based diet, you need about one and a half acres, right, per cow per year. On the other hand, if you're really pushing more alfalfa, well, given the differences in yield and so forth, at least as we have on our farm, because that's the data we used, you need about two acres per cow per year. So as you go between the two extremes and think about what you might be feeding, that factors into it, doesn't it, uh, in terms of a whole on-farm forage system. So keep that in mind. All right, so take-home messages and wrapping this up. Certainly alfalfa has significant agronomic benefits. That's not really my topic for this morning, but you've heard that story. There's people who can explain that to you way, way better than I can, uh, right in your backyard right there in Madison at ARS, all right? So keep that in mind. Our research showed that you can feed up to 90% forage alfalfa or corn silage in our, in our higher forage diets, and you'll get the same intake, energy corrected milk. Um, as I've said three times now, milk components appear to be optimized. Let's put it into a, a dry matter perspective. When alfalfa is between 20 and about 35% or so of the ration dry matter, that appears to be an optimal or sweet spot in terms of our formulation strategy, at least, all right? And I guess that my concluding point to you guys would be, in the future, sustainable dairy forage programs could, maybe should include higher alfalfa to corn silage ratios than we're commonly feeding in the industry, at least based on the trends I started out with, right? Alfalfa hay production has been going down. It just seems like overall, some of the surveys that are out there, Alfalfa percentage in the TMR has been dwindling over the last few decades. Um, nutritionally, we can, we can optimize things around 30, 70, 50, 50. 
And I think as we look at sustainability of the whole system, uh, we, should, we probably should be thinking about feeding more alfalfa, but it's gonna require pulling together any number of agronomic as well as nutritional and economic uh, factors. So stay tuned. I hope in the next year or two that there'll be some good progress made on behalf of the modeling groups that are working on this. So with that, uh, I know I've spoken fast and from New York, that's not a great excuse, but I know that it, it's gotta be a little tedious watching some talking head in the corner of a screen. And again, I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, if the technology works, I will be online uh, now to listen. We'll see about that. But anyway, um, thank you for listening. And again, please visit Miner Institute if you have a chance in the future. Um, and with that, I will stop and hopefully entertain questions if, uh, if we have a good link. Um, thank you for listening. All right. Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, let me, let's see, I think you should be able to, to hear me now. Let's go ahead and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to relay them to, uh, to Rick. Yes, sir. Okay, great question, Rick. So the question was, was there any measurement done, any differences that you observed in sorting and rumination behavior, lying behavior, uh, uh, feeding behavior, time spent at the bunk, time spent laying down, loafing, et cetera? Did you all do any kind of monitoring of that? Yeah, so is, is, is my voice coming through okay? So yes. people can hear me? Yes. Um, should I try the video? I don't want to use up the bandwidth. Um, they've just... I should just leave the video off, maybe. Um, anyway, yeah, that is a good question. So, um, things that we measured on there, in terms of behavior, so this was primarily a production study, so we didn't have a lot of, uh, of ability to measure behavior. We had SCR collars, so we measured rumination. You saw that data. Um, we didn't measure lying activity per se, um, so, so I can't really speak to that. My sense is, though, given the fact that there was, you know, 100% stocking density, that there was no constraints on, on the feed availability or the stalls, I would expect all the other behaviors to, to be pretty normal. Um, there might have been some effect on recumbent or lying down rumination, which we've been focused on, but we couldn't measure in this study. Um, the most important thing, though, your, the first part of your question was sorting. We did measure that, and we didn't see any indication of sorting across the diets. There were some variations, of course, but nothing uh, that was really substantially or significantly different among the five. As I said, the biggest challenge was, was the fifth diet, right? The highest alfalfa uh, rumination showed it. I would not recommend feeding that diet, practically speaking, on a farm. I don't think anybody would because it's a lot of hay and, and we were having a hard time getting the, the, the chop length correct on that, but, but no sorting. So, and, and I think we saw that with the, with the milk fat tests, they were phenomenal. Uh, our herd average is about four, but uh, we certainly didn't take anything off the top in terms of fat, fat output in this study. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't measure rumen pH, by the way. Uh, no, no fistulated cows on this study. Great question. Great question. I think one that also has some implications uh, with the choice of hay versus haylage or silage, that's going to make a little bit of a difference there too and how it sticks and, and uh, so. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't go into great detail on that because you're trying to get it done, <clears throat> excuse me, in a half hour. But, you know, on, on farm, we know the feeding silage in a lot of our TMR situations is just uh, technically it's easier, right? It holds together. As you say, there's more moisture. There's less ability for segregation and sorting. And, and you know, and, and chop length, getting the right particle distribution, I, we find is easier with silage than hay. Uh, but that being said, if you're in a part of the world where you might be shooting more for that intermediate level of hay, so not 90, 10, but maybe the 30, 70, 50, 50 around in there, uh, that can work real well in terms of overall particle distribution in the diet, you know, without, without any kind of heroic efforts in terms of trying to process your hay. But silage makes it easier for sure with the systems we typically have here in North America. Yeah. 
Okay. I can hear you fine. I can't okay. hear the audience. It, it breaks up a little bit. Yeah. Do you think that UNDF offset the uh, the the PENDF, the physical effective fiber? Yeah. Well, that's why I showed that one slide. And actually, I had the the idea to create the slide the way I did after I gave Dennis my slides. I think so. I think so. That that's actually something that we're wrestling with right now. Is you know, particle size is critically important. We know that. That's why we have this PENDF system we've used for so many years. You know, but that being said, as we learn more about uh, how cows respond to indigestible fiber, UNDF 240, you know, we've been focusing on that a lot since the Cornell group first kind of reinvigorated that five, six, seven years ago, Van Amberg's group and such, right? Dave Mertens was talking about it decades ago. Um, I really do think that, that we, can, we can do a better job of predicting cow response if we look at particle size and I'm saying UNDF 240 or some other measure, right? Because clearly if you just looked at particle size and didn't measure UNDF, you'd be really scratching your head. Why did the cows do so well, right? But you look at the combination of them, as I said, that gives you a, a physically effective UNDF, so to speak, that is right in the middle of where we, we think we ought to be based on our, our, our research here and other places, yeah. So yeah, I think I think you need them both, and I think measuring both gives you more insight into cow response. Absolutely, yeah. Agree with that, and I think if you go back and look at your ingredients, the the ratios there, and you actually consider that half of that corn silage is grain, you're going mm -hmm. for basically two thirds of the total dry matter is concentrate grain, and you're going down to forty percent on the ninety ten ratio. So. It's kind of remarkable that you basically did not see much of a difference uh, in, in, in those. And I think that gets to that, the, uh, the ratios there with the physically effective fiber. Yeah, and of course, the other thing we didn't, we didn't drill in as much as certainly I didn't present all the data today, but something we need to, to, to focus on more going forward is the whole starch side of things, right? Uh, yep. you, you never can ignore the starch interaction with fiber, and we didn't. And that was part of our prediction of what MP supply might be. But clearly, as you're going across a wide range of starch from corn silage, and we know that's very fermentable, it's high moisture corn, right? It, it gets a little bit tricky to try to predict how the cow is going to respond. Our models are good, but they're not perfect. Our lab measurements are good, but they're not, they're not always perfect either, right? In terms of starch and starch degradability. Yes, sir. Great question. So the question was, uh, Rick, uh, you yeah. used alfalfa hay. Any anything that you think would be different if we did, in fact, use haylage in that in that experiment instead? Yeah. Well, you know, <clears throat> from our perspective, the one thing that would have been much different it would have been easier for us frankly would be i think we could have we could have done a better job getting what we consider to be an ideal particle distribution you know i kind of alluded to that we we did a lot of runs with the with the hay buster and trying different ways of processing the hay at the bottom line though high quality hay is pretty fragile stuff right uh, but with, with silage you could set the the, the the knives on the chopper and so forth and really hit the, the mark in terms of that, that all important eight millimeter fraction of, of, of uh, silage. So that's the second tier of the Penn State particle separator. You know, that should be in a TMR, that should be 50 to 60% of your TMR. We didn't get that, not even close with our higher alfalfa diet. So that, that'd be the big thing is we, I think with, at least with our technology on our farm, with our choppers, we could do a better job with particle size. You wouldn't worry about adding water. It, it, technically, it's easier, right? You wouldn't have to add water. You wouldn't be as worried about potential for sorting, uh, the dry dustiness shrink when, when you're throwing stuff in a in any kind of a tub grinder, or hay buster, and you see that 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 puff of green stuff. You're like, oh crap, that's that's dry matter, right? And you don't know what combination of protein and, and, and NDF is blowing away in the North Country wind. So uh, technically, it'd be an easier diet to work with. But how that being said, I, I still think that the results we got in terms of intake, milk, milk composition, 
I believe you'd, you could reasonably expect to see something similar with silage. Does that make sense? It might be just an easier diet to put together and feed. Yeah, I think I think so. Other other questions? Jim? So one of the questions would be with the ratio, would it be any different in any results if about twenty five percent of that gain was grass, I call it grass. So question is would the result be a little bit different, do you think, if, say, about 25% of that was high-quality grass, say, in, a, in an alfalfa grass mixture? What Care to speculate what might happen there? Mm, yeah, I don't know. The, the ratio, the optimized ratio as we just defined it, yeah, it might be a little bit different. Certainly, you'd have to formulate a little differently, right, to take, to take into account the differences in uh, protein, for one thing, between grass and, and corn so and alfalfa. And they would have different, even with immature grass, there'd be some significant differences in the fiber uh, digestion kinetics, right? The profile of the fiber digestion. Uh, so the actual formulated ratio might be a little different. Um, I'd have to sit down and play with it some, but I think you'd still find some sort of an optimum, correct? Um, and I don't know that it would be over 50-50 necessarily. It might still be in the same general ballpark. Yeah, yeah, I but, agree. I but, think but, it you have you'd have to sit down and play with it. You have to get some high happy high quality grass for one thing. If you make yeah. that assumption, being a high producing cow, you could get that. You could kind of formulate that fairly quickly with with a model like CNCPS or some other pretty dynamic uh, a model. Uh, you, you you could you could get a diet that's not going to hurt you on the farm for sure. Yeah. There's rumination times that uh, that were shown there too. That was kind of an interesting slide. Yes, ma'am. The question, Rick, was really more about the economic slide that you presented there, and just as a general comment, I guess, and a question too, is uh, taking a, a more <clears throat> nuanced look at, at the economics and looking at that in more detail, obviously growing that on the farm versus uh, not being on the farm or purchasing it in. Um, I, I think that, I don't know in your calculations there if you did account for that being grown on the farm it does look like it was grown on the farm, but maybe more of a maybe more of a complete analysis overall. So the question is, is can can you do a, a better analysis? Is that it, basically, Dennis? Or uh, well, I like think a more it, I, yeah, taking into account the input cost on the forage production side of it. Yeah, and so this is. I tried to make that point clear. So this is just using the. the CNCPS platform, and maybe a few people have used that in the audience, but uh, I use modeling with air quotes because it's nothing like people are trying to do with Rufus and some other models, right? It's simply, you can put in cost of the dietary ingredients as they are on the farm at that point in time, and it, and it looks at the cost of the, 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 you know, yeah, the cost of the ration, right? Relative to the value of the milk produced. Um, and this was all using data from our farm when we did the study. And, and the big thing is that, uh, the relative economics of any proportion of alfalfa and corn silage is going to be driven a lot by, well, the cost of production. And that was just based on our farm. Every farm is going to be different. But also the prevailing cost of, of, of protein ingredients like soybean meal, byproducts, whatever they might be. And so I don't want that slide to convince somebody that uh, alfalfa is only useful if you grow it on the farm because that's what that slide showed. Um, that's just in one scenario, one economic situation on our farm, right? And so if I'm understanding the question right, we need to get more sophisticated for each farm situation, right? Because looking at economics is never going to be just a one-dimensional decision, although price of feed ingredients is huge. Yeah. Does that make sense, Dennis, if I'm understanding it right? Feel free to chime in. No, I, I think that I think the key is, you know, there's it's impossible really to look at every possible farm scenario. Uh, getting some some uh, good baseline there is very important. But I can tell you, if I was just looking at last night because we I'm preparing for a talk on alfalfa economics, 
fundamentally comparing it against corn silage, if you can't get five tons of yield regularly out of alfalfa, you're probably really going to be struggling to make this pencil. You really have to, to be pushing the envelope in terms of yield and you know sometimes we have a maybe an inflated idea of, of what we can do out of out of alfalfa. Um, yeah. Especially yeah. given you know the, the uh, number of trips across the field, the wheel traffic, etc. as well as the inputs. Yeah. Uh, right. The input side actually fares pretty co competitively to corn, but when you look at the total yield comparisons and the cost per unit, then then that fairness uh, comes back into play. Any yeah. last, one more. any final question? Well, if not, let's uh, show Rick our appreciation. He may not be able to see us, but maybe he can hear us. <laughs> I can't hear it, but I'll assume they're clapping. <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, thanks, Rick. We really yeah. appreciate you uh, doing this, and I apologize that uh, for, uh, you know, the fact that your uh, United flight didn't work out very well, but well, hopefully next year. Well, I, I apologize to you guys for not being there in person. I was looking forward to it, but uh, hope you all have a good time, and, uh, yeah, maybe next year. All right. Thanks, Rick. Take care. You bet. Bye-bye.